What people want to know is a history, my finances, all the rest. But really, how would you feel if I came up to you and said, excuse me, what's your credit card debt at the moment? How much is your home loan? How much are you earning? What are you worth? How much did you spend on entertainment? Do I have a, a valid reason to ask any of that? I know people want to know these things, I don't care. And no, I know what people say about signing things. And the blog post I released didn't make any promises. The Sartre piece didn't make any promises there. I said, I know how to, I know everything, and I'm not gonna give you any answers. And that remains how it is. So since that period, I've been working on papers. Uh, we have about 600 of them. I, on average, create probably one to two papers a day, every day of the week at the moment. Um, it slows down because of travel. Some days it's even more when I get back. Uh, we have a lot of patents that are coming out, and I know some people do and don't like intellectual property, but the reality is it helps actually grow the economy, and that's all that matters. And we're going to start announcing some of those. Some of them have become public, and we're releasing things now to basically change everything fundamentally. So the uh, question, are you the Bitcoin found, founder, get a yes or no answer from you? It will get no comment. All right, perfect. Uh, so th that says a lot about it. Um, let's move on now to the adoption of cryptocurrency. Now, Bitcoin, of course, has, uh, um, has been the prominent name that has been thrown out when people are trying to uh, uh, take it up. Uh, but uh, why are we seeing so much saturation, particularly within the African market? What's this obsession about? I don't know if we'd say saturation. I'd say this is very, very early. The reality is where I see Bitcoin going, and by Bitcoin I mean Bitcoin Cash. I, I meant the saturation globally, not, not within the African continent. I don't continent. even see it there. This is very small. We're a fraction of a percent of global uh, trade. And what you're talking about is speculation and people doing speculative day trades, which at the end of the day, for most people out there, Cryptocurrency is no more than basically going and gambling. Now, that's not what I want to see. What I want to see is an actual trading unit, monetary unit, something that we create smart contracts on, something that we co tokenize goods and services on. And we're now starting to move into releasing product for that and we're going to have and open up the ability to trade, to create logistic systems, transport systems, tracking systems. We're going to enable companies, basically whether they're small or as big as someone like Amazon, to more efficiently trade and transact. And that's all that really matters. And at the end of the day you can say uh, all this other stuff is important, but it's not. A global monetary system that enables end-to-end -end tracking, enables trust, enables escrow, enables the ability to monitor every little problem along the global supply chain that enables people to actually hedge and buy into what we have in the West in countries like Rwanda here so that they can actually pre-sell their coffee harvest so that they can put out um, investment strategies saying that if I do this and put new types of coffee variety in I'll get prepaid by investors who actually do that as well. That's what Bitcoin is really about. Um, you are very vocal uh, against an African cryptocurrency. Tell us why. I'm very vocal against anything that is a non-global system. Now, the reason Africans don't trade with other Africans to the extent they do with the West is Africans don't want to buy coffee from other places in Africa. Ethiopia isn't going and buying coffee beans from Moranda. Rwanda and Kenya aren't swapping coffee beans. They're not swapping base raw goods. If you want to make this global, then you have to engage globally. And this idea that you solve everyone's problems by having a global currency, no you don't. Look at Europe, look at Greece, look at Spain. They are not having problems because the Euro, as some people say, they're having problems because they don't have anything to trade. The tourism, uh, sort of aspects of Greece are one thing, but it's not enough to actually make the country competitive. And unless people face that, 
you can blame everything you want. And Africa can sit here and blaming a lack of trade between other African countries. It can blame the West. It can blame everyone all at once. But that's very petty. You don't get anywhere by sitting there and saying, oh, look what they did to us 100 years ago. And quite frankly, everywhere in the world has had some really bad stuff in its past. I mean, England was invaded by the, the Normans who ended up staying and raped, pillaged and destroyed monasteries, destroyed land before taking it over. So it's part of everyone's history. And the fact that some terrible, terrible things happened here and the worst part was most of it was done because of people in the West exploiting the divisions between different countries and different kingdoms and different tribes within Africa. I mean, the French, for instance, the Germans, etc., who uh, engaged in the slave trade here couldn't have done it without Africans helping destroy other Africans. Now, if we want to move forward, we need to start thinking how we engage people, not blame people, but trade with them. And I see trade as this thing that opens up not just a richer world, but a world that is more interactive, where people have to start learning what each other is like. I mean, the first um, American basketball or football team to actually take a um, black American player was owned by one of the biggest racists in America. But he did it because he made money. And he looked past his prejudices, as bad as they were, because he could actually profit. So this is, we, we keep saying profit's a dirty word, but women start getting into the community and, and earning because profit. Minorities because of profit. Profit is maligned by those who are already there and don't want competition. Speaking of which, uh, you've talked about profit. Um, where does Bitcoin lie now with its outlook? Because you, you, in, you hinted on uh, not investing in Bitcoin, particularly at this point, because of the crash. Um, I will say invest in Bitcoin cash if you want. Um, I'm not going to give you financial advice. I'm going to build not short term. I don't pump. I don't really care about the next six months. I care about the next 20 years. And in that period, I want to slowly, safely, surely build solutions that will take Bitcoin and in its cash form to a global payment system with smart contracts, with tokenization of goods, basically as an underlying system with proof knowledge uh, type uh, integrations that enable smart ownership of property, uh, exchange of goods and value everywhere that enable investment no matter where in the world you happen to be. So what, what, just to, for me to get the sense of where your mind is, right in the heat of things, when the price of Bitcoin may be moved from 3000 to 25000 is that precedented? Oh, throughout history, yes. Um, most people don't realise that in the, I think it's 204 countries at the moment, um, it changes all the time, unfortunately, um, so I'm probably wrong there. Um, most of those currencies are extremely volatile. Most of them go from something to nothing. Now, the aspect that people are looking at is speculation. So I'm still going to look at Bitcoin Cash, which went from 200 now to 15, 1600, and it went up to 4,000 at one stage because there was a huge jump in bubble. Now, how thick that market was also matters. So. Uh, unfortunately, not many people seem to get that the depth of a market is actually important as well. So at 1,500 or so, it's actually quite strong. At 4,000, there was one single trade and it was hundreds and hundreds of dollars above. So someone just had to jump in no matter what. And unfortunately, I can't help fools and money. Um, but the same thing can be said if we look at 2013 and you bought right at the peak. If you did that, right before Mt. Gox happened and everything crashed, and you held, and you held till now, you still had one of the best investments on earth. Final point, uh, you touched on uh, the money markets, of course, interest and volatility were some of the issues that were raised. And along the same breath, you mentioned that uh, you're not 
a, a fire starter or someone who likes to uh, just rile the crowd, but you're against anyone who uh, is stupid. A very controversial statement, but I need you to explain that. And this is the first time I've seen you smile. Uh, not always stupid. Sometimes it's just greedy. Um, and by greedy, I'm not saying profit is bad. What I'm saying is people who want to make money and not deliver something. And most of these things are. They'll come in there and give you advice and they set up things so that they can make consulting value or whatever else and deliver nothing. 